At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. And today I have not only a stellar psychedelic therapist, but also a good friend and colleague, Dr. Rosalind Watts. Can I call you Ros? Yes, please do. Thank you for having me. It's very, very nice to be here with you. Well, Ros, you're a psychologist and you, I remember vividly when you came to join the team. Wow, I must have been about six or seven years ago now. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But tell us a little bit about your background before that, before you fell foul of uh, the psychedelic <laughs> world. You trained as a psychologist at UCL, is that right? Yes, yeah, I, I trained in clinical psychology, I think. 2009 I started my training there yeah and had a very kind of CBT cognitive behavioral therapy focused training and which was really quite far away from psychedelic therapy in many ways and yeah I don't think psych psychedelic therapy wasn't really covered although we did have Val Curran there with her ketamine research so I had a, a little inkling of, of what was going on in the psychedelic world but I wasn't I have to say I wasn't actually particularly interested in it at that point when I was doing my training I was much more focused on other other areas I was quite interested in forensic psychology because I'd worked at the Tavistock and Portman in the, the Portman clinic which is a fascinating place. A lot of people won't know what that is I mean they may have heard of the Tavistock but they won't have heard of the Portman. Yes. Do you want us to say a little bit about that please? The Portman clinic is an absolutely wonderful place in Hampstead it's kind of quite unique I think in the NHS in that it's a, a kind of Victorian house staffed by an absolutely wonderful eccentric brilliant team of psychoanalysts and they always have one assistant psychologist so they have kind of like I don't know 20 psychoanalysts incredibly experienced clinicians and then one lucky assistant psychologist that gets to go and learn from them so I was lucky enough to be their assistant for uh, two years and yeah I did some fascinating work with them looking at yeah all sorts of amazing research projects with their client population which is people who are some people who've been to prison and then they were referred to psychotherapy and um, some people referred themselves because of yeah patterns of behavior that they were worried about and that they couldn't stop so that's very interesting work and actually it's funny that we're talking about it because it's something that one day I really hope to be able to combine the psychedelic work with the the prison populations because when I was at Imperial, I used to cycle home past Wormwood Scrubs and see lots of men in the, the exercise yard. They were just about to be released back into the world. And I kept thinking, we've got a psychedelic clinic around here, like next door to you. And how amazing it would be if those, those men could come and have a few months of psychedelic therapy before going back to the community. Well, indeed, there's, there's certainly evidence from, I think, the US, a couple of papers suggesting that recidivism or, you know, the ability to stay out of prison is enhanced if people have a psychedelic experience. It may change the way they relate to the world or even their, you know, desire to commit crime. So absolutely with you. We'll, we'll park that as our ambition and we maybe come back yeah. to that at the end because it's that, that's a big ask at present. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. One day, one day. So then how did you... Because my recollection is that you, you turned up and we were having some kind of party and you turned up and you, I think. <laughs> oh, yes. Then suddenly you emerged into our group and you explained you were going to come and work with us. And, uh, and we, how did you find out about us? So, it's, so after finishing my UCL clinical training, I then went to work in the NHS as a clinical psychologist working in a community mental health team, which I really loved. But when I became pregnant with my daughter Tabitha um, I went on maternity leave and I suddenly for the first time in a very long time had time because in the NHS and the community mental health team it was just 
the end of the day, I was so completely exhausted that I would never have read any papers or engaged in anything ex kind of extracurricular. So I just suddenly when I was up late at night breastfeeding with with Tabby, I suddenly had time. And my my best friend Karis had suffered from depression whilst we were teenagers. We used to live next door to each other and she became quite low in her teenage years and then at university. And she had gone to Peru to have an ayahuasca ceremony. And I had, I remember my sister and I, my sister, I told my sister, you know, Karis is gonna go and drink this thing called, I, I couldn't pronounce it properly. And my sister Googled it and, you know, messaged me back saying, tell Karis not to go. Lots of people die, it's really dangerous. So I remember me and Karis having an argument because I said like, please don't do this crazy thing. You know, you're going to the jungle. You could be, you know, it could be really dangerous. I had no idea about it. And then since that time, she came, you know, she had this amazing experience. It, it was incredibly powerful for her and it really helped with her depression. Her depression kind of went afterwards. So because I had that in the back of my mind, when I suddenly had this time on maternity leave, I started Googling, you know, her experience. And, and, and then through those Google searches, I found the article by Michael Pollan, The Trip Treatment, which talked about you and Robin, and it talked about the study at Hammersmith Hospital. And I just, I emailed Robin just on a whim, just as, you know, I'm on maternity leave, I've got a bit of time. And he emailed back straight away saying, actually, we kind of need a female psychologist. So can you come <laughs> and start? And so I did. But you didn't just come and start, did you? Because you actually decided you wanted to find out a little bit more about what we were doing before you came. And I have to say that was rather impressive what you did. If you're, are you happy to talk about it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, I suddenly realised that, you know, as I said before, you know, I kind of, I was really, I was really unaware of, of, of this kind of work. I mean, I, I remember somebody telling me at some point that, you know, about MDMA therapy, it was all in, in early stages then. So I was really not very aware. And I suddenly realized that if I was going to come and be a sitter for people going through psilocybin therapy for the depression, that I really needed to have my own psychedelic therapy experience. And the only way I could access that legally was to go to an ayahuasca retreat, which I then did as my homework for the new job your prep and it, it didn't put you off anyway <laughs> well I mean I had an absolutely harrowing experience and I think as well as you know very beautiful and very profound and learning a lot very challenging experience so I think in a way it stood me in good stead because through the work with Imperial with the psilocybin for depression research I think I've always held on to my own experience of how how torturous it can be. And so that I think was in a way quite useful preparation for me to, to always be incredibly mindful of just how raw you can, you can feel during it and after it. So you joined the team and you were the, essentially the lead therapist in the two big depression trials, weren't you? And each one getting more demanding than the next. Do you know how many, how many times you've guided for us? <sighs> Well, let me think about, I've probably sat through about 50 sessions, I think, something about around that number, yeah. And you've also been the star of several uh, several, vi several <laughs> movies about it as well, so. Yeah, it was the time, the timing of it was just when all the media kind of focus was starting. So yeah, there was a lot of that. But you came into it as a, as a trained CBT therapist, as I guess what most people are trained to do when they work in the NHS, and then you, and you realise, I think, that that probably wasn't what you were going to do, at least when you were helping people get the benefits of the, uh, of the psychedelic experience. But, but perhaps before we go on to that, why don't you tell people just exactly how you, as a, the most experienced guide we've had so far, how you, how, tell them about a session, what it's like about getting someone ready for a psychedelic treatment from the very beginning. So I think... From the very big so people we saw it as a three-day block so they'd have they come in for the prep kind of from the morning time they'd have a prep day then a session day and then a, an integration day so they would come with us and they would have two overnight stays usually and the prep day was a, we'd already met them because we'd had screening with them so we'd had some calls and we'd know people relatively well by that stage but the prep day 
we really try to maximize in a short space of time the sense of trust and rapport and knowing each other in, in a human way as opposed to the slightly more kind of formal um, boundaries that you might have in traditional psychotherapy where you know you're more of a kind of blank slate really and I think for going through the psychedelic experience people they need to see who you are as a human being because when they're in that very altered state if it is very intense and quite, can be quite frightening I think they need to be able to kind of look at you sitting there and know that you're a human being and that you can help them if they need that and that they can completely trust you to be absolutely ethical with them in that that difficult vulnerable situation so yeah I think it's helpful to 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 be very real and authentic with people so we'd have lunch with people the two guides they would always have two therapists two guides in the room we'd have lunch together and then we'd have an afternoon doing a prep session which would include a visualization which was the main preparation because in this visualization we'd ask them to imagine that the psilocybin experience the next day is a bit like going on a pearl dive so swimming out to sea diving down into the water and rather than getting distracted by the pretty colors actually diving down to the darkest layers and and finding the deepest parts of themselves so we did a visualization and that would be a kind of practice run for the next day and then the next day would be the psilocybin experience I mean, and, and actually that in itself could be very profound people often had some interesting realizations without any psychedelics involved just from that visualization with the therapist and the music and then the next day six hours with the two therapists and, and a playlist a set playlist and yeah just being with them with whatever came up and at the end of that session having some time to talk but not too much then they'd go and sleep next door in the accommodation and then the next morning we'd uh, have a, a nice long a special cup of tea we had very special tea that was a very important part of the psychedelic therapy and um, there's a particular kind of tea called bengal spice which is a very delicious caffeine free chai tea which we we had lots of and actually lots of people especially in the the one milligram group that didn't get the active psilocybin dose said that had it not been for the tea they would have felt very disappointed but actually uh, they they had some nice nice moments and that the tea was a was a life changer so yeah i mean i'm being slightly facetious because there were lots of yeah lots of people very disappointed getting the low dose well perhaps we'll come back to that in a minute let's just talk about the general so the third day is the integration session where you talk about what they actually found when they dive down to the pearl is that right exactly so we would sit with them and it's yeah quite kind of relaxed and quite casual and it's not like a normal therapy session and that it's much more kind of fluid and flexible and yeah they they would talk through yeah the, the pearls that they gathered and often there was still quite a lot of confusion you know there would still be not really some some bits of it would feel quite unclear and sometimes people yeah would feel yeah they still needed some more grounding work so we sometimes listen to the playlist again the next day to help people ground and some meditation as well sometimes and just for people who are not familiar with the exact what goes on during the the trip day um, do you want to just say a little bit more about that i mean people you said you mentioned the playlist but are there headphones and are eye shades or what is going on so the participant lies on a so the room is decorated we had a decoration of a woodland scene so very relaxing with salt lamps and low lighting a nice sound system with a playlist playing soothing relaxing music and then the two therapists sit either side of the participant. The participant wears eye shades and headphones with the music coming through the headphones and also playing in the room. And the, the therapists sit close enough to be able to hold the participant's hands if the participant wants that. So often in the first part when they had the psilocybin capsules, they would reach out as we practice in the prep day and hold the hands of both guides. Yeah, that's important, isn't it, Ros? Just to be clear, you get permission to hold. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Lots of discussion in the prep session around, I mean, a lot of the prep session is kind of negotiating, you know, boundaries. What would we do if this happened? What would we do if that happened? And the participants often have lots of concerns and fears like, you know, what if I embarrass myself? What if I lose control? You know, so you really work through all of their fears and, and how you'll respond as a, as a team to anything. And yet, and, and touch and hand holding is, is part of that discussion. So then they, you give them the, uh, I like, you did make the rooms very beautiful. I do remember the, the challenges of you going out finding these salt lamps and the, where you could store the, uh, the wooden images and that, but you succeeded. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize, I'll just say this little bit, just to, so people understand the chat. Every day 
because we were using a room in a major hospital, the Hammersmith Hospital, which is, they spend a lot of time doing other things like cancer therapy and cardiac interventions and gene therapy. Every day we had to clear out the room or set up the room to make it a bit more like something that's more human and, uh, and less clinical. And then as you did, and then every night we had to break it down. So it wasn't just the whole strain of, of the therapy. It was also the strain of preparing the room and getting everything organized and trying to explain to medical staff, why are you doing this? You actually, yeah. the concept you're doing something with their mind, it was a bit challenging to them. They didn't quite understand that, but that's the, that's the cross we have to bear being psychiatrists and psychologists. The rest of medicine doesn't really understand. <laughs> But then you you had this nice little gesture. You had the uh, you had the psilocybin in a little bowl, a sort of ceremonial bowl, which you handed to them, which I thought was was that your idea? Yes. Yeah, so that bowl was actually that bowl I saw in an art gallery because it's a beautiful wooden bowl engraved really beautifully. I saw that in an art gallery with Sam, um, Sam Gandhi, uh, who's another psychedelic researcher and ecologist, and he bought that as a present for yeah for for me and for the study. And I still have that on my shelf now, and it's. Yeah, beautiful bowl. It has a little chip on it, actually. But I love the little chip on it because it's like that kind of the analogy of, have you heard of the Kintsugi? I think Mendel Kalin, who's also from, uh, was in the Imperial Lab before me, he, he loves this idea of the Kintsugi pot, which is a, it's a pot that uh, in, I think it's in Chinese or Japanese art. It's, fra it's smashed on purpose to the floor and then put together with gold glue. Ah. The idea that, you know, our imperfections make us more whole. Something that's been broken when it's healed is is more precious for for having been through the process. So, I've I've got my little chip on the wooden bowl and I've healed it. So it's a nice little symbol of that process. It's quite a big moment, isn't it? A threshold moment when you they have to decide to take it. I mean, I remember that certainly at least one of one of the people in the study was pretty hesitant about doing that. We've got to get off the bed and thought, you know, maybe I can't get. Yes. I remember actually one participant, he was so nervous and it was such deep physiological anxiety and we were quite creative with the music, you know, because the music is, it, I mean, is the third therapist. So we played, um, what was it? There was, a, I think it was like, we are the champions or one of those kind of really like kind of galvanizing motivated songs. And I think we kept playing it and he was going to take the capsules as soon as we played it. We played that song maybe 20 times before he was ready. <laughs> To go for it. so then and then they wait and then they lie back and wait yes then you know the effect comes on over what 15 20 minutes and gradually rises to a peak yeah sometimes it took longer and yes we'd, we'd be sitting there kind of wondering waiting sometimes you could tell sometimes you couldn't tell hmm. did anyone not have an experience who got a high dose 25 milligram dose well I think a couple of people really hardly had anything, almost felt like they just didn't feel it. Almost like nothing happening at all. I remember one person having a feeling something, but feeling, I think this was one of the first participants and it was before we changed the way we did the prep. So initially we didn't realize that we needed to really counteract some of the media that came as a result of the first study. So in the first study, did this qualitative analysis and there were all these lovely quotes about what psilocybin had done and some participants had said oh it felt like it reset my brain which I think we then said to a few journalists and then there are all these headlines saying you know psilocybin resets the brain and of course in some ways it you know the, the neurological effects it, maybe you can say it is a good analogy but in terms of the of many of the participants they'd seen these headlines and they were kind of coming and expecting a kind of pill that was just going to reset their brain without anything like challenge it was just going to automatically reset it so this particular participant took the, 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 the capsules and then when the effect started coming on thought oh I, I, do, I really don't like this this is a side effect of this drug and he really resisted and resisted and then it was only afterwards that we, we were able to explain you know it's yeah it kind of doesn't work that way the, re the resetting process can be much more engaged and challenging yeah, that's a very important point. I'll come back to that a discussion about that in a minute. But just I want to make it very clear to people who, you know, really haven't, maybe haven't. The few people listening to this who've not seen Magic Medicine or the, the Psychedelic Drug Trial, uh, the actual the session where there people are tripping is is quite quiet. Mostly, there's you're not there's not a there's no directive conversation. You're not asking them questions. You're not asking them to think. You're just there just in case they need you. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. 
and sometimes yeah most of the day is is quiet and then certain times people will really want to engage and you make a judgment whether that engagement is part of their process and it's important to go with it or sometimes you feel that the engagement is maybe slightly an avoidance because there's something difficult going on and they you know but talking, you can kind of avoid it so you have to feel into whether to encourage them to put the eyeshades back on and go back inside or whether to actually stay with them in the conversation because that conversation might be really important Yes. And actually, that touches on another really a question I get asked every time I give a lecture, literally, every, which is, what do you do with bad trips? And I tell people that, you know, the concept of a bad trip is a slightly misunderstanding. You know, this is, again, something that's all the media generated. I mean, you know, they're good and bad in most trips and the bad trips can still be profoundly beneficial. What would you say to the uh, to people about so the kind of the current term that is became more popular in psychedelic research was challenging experience. They kind of rebranded the bad trip as a challenging experience. But actually, I quite like bad trip because there are some things that do you know, challenging is slightly euphemistic. And actually, sometimes people are just in a place that feels very hellish and incredibly painful and, and intolerable. And when they get stuck as well in a kind of loop, that's when it really becomes like this like the kind of the 60s bad trip kind of idea and I think if you're going through something like that at a festival or out and about somewhere or with friends who aren't very experienced then that is one of the most terrifying things I can even imagine but if you're going through that with two therapists there who are have prepared you for this experience that if it happens it's this rich opportunity to really go to the darkest places of yourself, the darkest corner. You know, we all have these places within us and, you know, it's that kind of it's better out than in. You know, if you're being called to look in that part of the cave, you've got these two therapists with you. So it's a really good opportunity to go there. And because the people that came to the study all had been suffering from depression for a long time, it was like, let's really welcome that because you're not here for like a jolly. You've been going through some awful times. And so if the experience takes you to that pain, then let's let's really welcome that opportunity to look at it together. So but it doesn't make it any easier for the person no. going through it. But it does make does emphasize not just the value, I would say the necessity of having a trained and experienced guide with you. Yes. Hello, Drug Science Podcast listeners. I wanted to quickly tell you about an event we're hosting on the 9th and 10th of April, 2022. And this is the second Drug Science Student Psychedelic Conference. The last one was an enormous success, not least because, of course, it's the most inexpensive psychedelic conference in the world, with tickets as low as £5 for a two-day online conference. And during the conference, we're going to cover a whole range of different topics, music, philosophy, relationships, and much more. And you can find the tickets in the show notes for this episode and on the Drug Science website. And I look forward to meeting you all again at the conference. And now, back to the show. And then the next day, the integration sessions, then who leads that? Often, I guess, they come and talk about the experience and want to share and elaborate and get your insights. Is, is that how it goes? Yeah. So, oh, gosh, I really remember the feeling of, so we get the room already. As you say, you have to pick it up, take it down, pick it up. So we get the room already and get the nice herbal tea on the go and try to make the room as kind of welcoming for them as possible. And I really remember the feeling of like it being nine o'clock and going out to the reception area to meet them. So they'd stayed in the accommodation the night before. And I'd always know when I saw the person in the waiting room, how, how it had gone, because sometimes you would see someone in the waiting room the next morning and they would just look completely different. Their face was looked kind of 10 years younger, relaxed, glowing. And that was always, you know, quite an amazing experience just to see that change from one day to the next but then there would be times when you'd go and meet someone in the reception and you could see from their face that actually they'd been up all night they'd been you know that they'd actually they were still you know they were very disappointed sometimes they said you know I thought this was going to be a brain reset and actually I still feel quite depressed today right but you work with that and that's what I wanted to get back to then you know you, you come from a sort of traditional that sort of evidence-based therapy, CBT, make people rethink their bad thoughts. And then you're in this completely new kind of therapy, this you know, very different experience. Because CBT often has, they don't, well, most of them had failed on CBT. So was it, do you think your um, two years of part-time 
the exposure to psychoanalysis helped you come up with <laughs> new ways of thinking? I think probably, yeah, the, the visualization work. I do think the visualization is a really important part of psychedelic therapy. And actually there's, there's quite a good tradition of visualization work through, um, I remember Bill Richards who did some training with us. Maybe explain who Bill is, because a lot of people will not know. He's, you know, he's. I suppose he's the he's the great modern guru of psychotherapy from Hopkins. Is that right? Yeah. So he wrote the book Sacred Knowledge. He's a very experienced psychedelic therapist. He was working with psychedelic therapy in the fifties and sixties, and then had to stop the work when it all got shut down. But then was one of the first to pick it back up again when it got restarted. So he's got this very long lineage, and he, I think he, I think Maslow was his teacher. Yeah. I mean, he's. He comes from an illustrious line of amazing therapists and he he built on the words i think it's hans karl leuner who's the visualization imagination person and of course carl jung as well did lots of work with the imagination and visualization so these are influences of psychedelic therapy and that work always appealed to me quite a lot because i quite i quite like kind of creative approaches to things so visualization is extremely creative because in cognitive behavioral therapy there's a manual that's set by the person that's, you know, come up with a theory and they're really interesting theories, but every session is planned out. So you get a 10 session intervention for like panic disorder. And I remember going in as a clinical psychologist doing this and just thinking, oh my goodness, every session is literally to the last minute planned out already. I, there's nowhere for the participant, for the patient to go. And there's nowhere for me to go. Whereas with visualization work, you're kind of creating a bit of a landscape but then the participant fleshes that out themselves and they can go wherever they want to go and i think that journey is so much richer because it's coming from the unconscious and they're going to where they need to go without even kind of yes yeah i think you started introducing the concept of act to me and to the others in the do you want to just elaborate a bit on on acceptance commitment therapy yeah so when i was at ucl because we were it was mostly cbt there were some they're called as like third wave cbt approaches which includes acceptance and commitment therapy and also a few others like dialectical behavioral therapy which are kind of like cbt but slightly they're the kind of more flexible open third way so they're yeah i'd say they're the, the most modern types of cbt and acceptance and commitment therapy is uh, it's, it's a wonderful model. It, it's based around this idea of uh, psychological flexibility. So in, in acceptance and commitment therapy, the fundamental concept is we can be in states of psychological rigidity and psychological flexibility. And there are kind of six processes. It's all about being able to be in touch with the present moment, be in touch with your emotions versus being in, in a resistance and avoidance, really. So acceptance and commitment therapy helps people to open up no matter what they're going through whether they're having therapy for depression or an eating disorder or, or something else it's they don't focus so much on the actual kind of symptoms of that particular presentation but it's more about how you can open up and become psychologically flexible to deal with whatever it is that you're suffering with and you know what's utterly remarkable and i'm not sure you know this Ros, because the paper's not published yet but there is a paper going to be published very shortly probably before this podcast comes out actually which where we've looked at the brain imaging of both the psilocybin trials the, the first one and the second one and we can visualize this we can visualize improved flexibility in the brain the brain is more is less modular it's more more connected and more flexible so this is that is it's a kind of weirdly congruent as you might say you know yeah. neuroscience with the with the psychology it's very exciting it's wonderful it's, and i love the i love the focus on psychological flexibility because i think there has been a lot of i mean obviously mystical experiences it's really important predictor of good outcomes sometimes and people often come into psychedelic therapy wanting a mystical experience but being able to focus people more on psychological flexibility i think is it's a lovely area to focus on because it kind of covers everything because you know the spiritual experiences are a kind of part of that flexibility for some people but not necessarily but rather than going in with the expectation of expectation of you know i want to see god if you go into saying i want to increase my flexibility it's basically saying i want to be open to whatever comes up you know and to learn from it and the really remarkable thing about the serotonin psychedelics like psilocybin and, and dmt is that they 
they promote this flexibility at a biological level as well as a psychological level and they facilitate being able to progress or maintain the gains you've already you've made during the experience which is it's kind of you know a perfect circle isn't it <laughs> yeah it is wonderful it's very i can't yeah that's very exciting about that paper as well and then of course we got to the situation which all academics got to we ran out of money and we couldn't keep you but then you went off to to become the lead therapist in synthesis in the netherlands so that was a big step and a, and a very important one do you want to share with us how that went and uh, and how it is now i guess problems with covid <laughs> Yeah, so it was an interesting time because Synthesis had to stop all retreats because of COVID. So actually the whole, so yeah, no retreats were able to go ahead. Tell the people about Synthesis, because I think a lot of people don't realise what a remarkable uh, organisation it is. And it is. It is. It is an amazing, it's a wonderful team of people. And actually, so it started life as a retreat centre in the Netherlands because truffle, psilocybin truffles are legal there. Yeah, it's a way that people can access psilocybin. So then it's expanded massively. So it started off as a retreat center, realizing that they had some very skilled facilitators in their team and that their retreat team had really become, just so many people had been to their retreats and had really profound, powerful experiences. They realized that they were really harnessing some quite important skills. And then they realized that lots of people needed to train to become psychedelic facilitators. So they started a psychedelic practitioner training, which is now finishing the first cohort. So I'm the clinical track lead of that. And our first cohort finishes is, is you know, coming towards the end. It's an amazing group of people, really diverse, not just therapists, but people from different backgrounds. And they're not trained to become psychedelic therapists. But yeah, there's a certain kind of working in retreat centers, facilities that kind of thing. Some of them do have a clinical background. So yeah, that people will come away with different skill sets from that training, but it's, yeah, so they have the, the practitioner training, they have the retreat center. They now are going to start a center in Oregon as well, because Oregon is soon to be legalizing psychedelic therapy. Yes. Oh, so the synthesis are going to, because that's always been one of the questions in my mind, you know, it's wonderful that Oregon's going to have <laughs> statewide, that's a big state. It's bigger than Britain, I think. Uh, state, <laughs> Statewide psychedelic mushroom therapy, but but who's going to provide it? So since this is going to go out there and do some training, are they? That's good. Yeah, yeah. There, I think there will be a number of different providers, but yeah, synthesis have got really good roots in the work now. And I yeah, I think I think what I really yeah, they've got a lot of integrity actually. Synthesis and it's you know it's quite a wild west out there, as you know. It's like a bit of a gold rush at the moment. You know, psychedelic. There's a real kind of bubble of of it. Interesting analogy. You're right. It is a bit like the wild west, but it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, but synthesis are kind of, you know, they're, it's, they're, they've gone through huge expansion and lots of changes. And actually the reason I joined this because, so Rachel, their CEO, has always had an interest in, yes, yeah, so psychedelic retreats for people is, is wonderful, but she always had this real sense of, I want to provide this work to the people that need it, really need it the most, people that are suffering from depression and other clinical diagnoses. And that at the time they couldn't do it because, you know, kind of, they were wellness retreats essentially. So she brought me on because she wanted to set up a clinical therapy clinic as part of synthesis where we could offer psychedelic therapy to people with depression. But actually what we found through the process of, you know, is that although it's, it's one of these like awful ironies really of, of the slightly topsy turvy systems we find ourselves in. So in the Netherlands, you can go to any shop and buy psilocybin truffles and take them. They're absolutely fine with no regulation at all. And you can have a retreat with facilitators that aren't trained mental health practitioners and have no experience with people going through any kind of crisis. That's all fine and legal. But as soon as you're somebody with a psychiatric diagnosis, taking those same truffles with a very trained mental health professional, it actually becomes not legal. So we, we only found that out through lots and lots of kind of really inquiring at every level of kind of just checking things out, making sure like how is you know is this definitely going to be okay and actually you know some of the regulations changed in the netherlands things shifted but yeah we came to this understanding that actually the netherlands don't want to encourage people to be using it in a clinical way because it's not yet licensed it's still unproven and they said you know if you're a if you're a clinician and you're working with psilocybin then you're basically vouching for something that hasn't yet been through the necessary process of testing so yeah so we couldn't actually set at that time 
hopefully they'll change in future but at that time we weren't able to set up the depression treatment arm of synthesis that we wanted to but what it allowed is us to instead do a kind of we did the therapy without the actual truffle retreats so we still built a, ther a 12 month therapeutic program we just didn't include the truffle retreats which basically helped us build an integration program essentially so we piloted that so people could go and go to the retreat and then come to your to your integration could they was that was that the vision well so that's kind of the vision now so so the way we did it at synthesis we did it with a pilot group of 20 people, many of whom were from the Imperial Studies, people with depression who had been through the trial and then the depression had come back like six months later. And then they were, they joined our pilot program. And the idea was that people would have a 12 month therapy program and that halfway through they would come and have a psilocybin and truffle retreat in the Netherlands. But because we couldn't do that retreat, partly because of COVID and then because of this regulation thing, um, we essentially just did it as the 12 month therapy program so based on that experience I am now going to offer that same therapy program but as an online community so people that are doing their own psychedelic work whether it's a clinical trial or whether they're just doing it through retreats or just doing it at home it's a kind of an, a rolling program and community that people can join so that they can do some integration work together Oh, well, that's good, and, and, and good luck to you for that. I mean, it's, it is completely absurd, isn't it? And the people who perhaps need it most are denied it most, simply because we have this kind of bizarre uh, attitude to what a medicine is something that a pharmaceutical company has developed and then sells to a government, which rather is kind of a bit counter to what medicine used to be. But I don't want to go down that track. That, that's a difficult one. But, but I want to talk a bit about wellness, because it seems to me that one of the exciting things about Oregon, because I think Oregon is going to, and synthesis, of course. If you were to have the experiences before you were ill, you might be well enough not to get ill. Do you think, do you think that's a pretty, is that a kind of credible kind of theory? Well, I think that as we start to really take on board these ideas of psychological flexibility and this idea of the, what health and wellness is, is about being able to really go through the whole emotional repertoire of life openly with resilience and with the ability to actually feel our feelings because I think so much about our ideas about what it's meant to be healthy and well is about being fine you know often people want to just kind of cope and be okay and I think there has been this you know obviously antidepressants for some people are just a, an amazing treatment but for some people they, they describe that they kind of numb their feelings a bit and that they just help them soldier on and I think as our society starts to learn that actually that kind of soldiering on and, you know, everything's OK, that that approach doesn't help or work. And that actually, if our society can really open up to this idea of we need to have rituals and ceremonies and we need to have ways that our community can process grief together and we can cry and all of these things, if we can have those kind of structures from our you know teenage years onwards then probably we wouldn't need psychedelic therapy for depression because actually we would have found a healthier way of dealing with our emotions with our community from an earlier age i'll tell you a story i don't think i, I have told you this but uh, a couple of years ago i was on um, on the bbc talking about my favorite book and uh, i talked about island by aldous huxley and which is a Basically, a kind of, you know, it's a it's a roadmap, as we'd say today, for that kind of society where you use a combination of psychological approaches, social approaches and, and psychopharmacological approaches to to maximize human well-being. And then a few weeks later, I was talking to a, a group of addiction experts and one of them stood up and absolutely abused me for daring to talk about the use of an illegal drug in terms of well-being. And I thought, I mean, it's, I mean, of course, it's completely absurd. I mean, you know, the concept of illegality in drugs is, you know, is also I mean, in itself is absurd. But the idea that you could never have enough mental flexibility to consider the values, I just thought it was, you know, and it, it does, it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a lesson, really, that we still got a long way to go. We, you know, we may see, and as we have, and you have more than most, the, the enormous value of just a single psychedelic experience in terms of people's depressions. And 
But it's there's still a lot of convincing to do because so many people like the idea that you know that well they like to ban things and they you know they kind of like the idea that people should be able to survive and get by without this kind of pharmacological help. But you know you've seen the value of it. So what would you say? To, what would you say to that person next time he shouts at me? <laughs> <laughs> I think I I in a way when what comes up for me when you describe that is I just feel I wonder whether for that person that strength of that reaction that kind of rage and anger, whether actually it comes from a place of real fear from that person of the idea of losing control and letting go in that way. Because I think for, our, you know, there is, for a lot of people, the idea of a psychedelic experience is absolutely terrifying. And they think that, you know, going into those dark places is just all hell will break loose. And what will happen to our society when this hell breaks loose on a collective scale? So I think really for those people, it's kind of fear, isn't it? And probably when people i mean i just wish they could experience it i just wish and maybe like i think psilocybin experiences may be a, a bit too much for some people but i i think that mdma experiences which are tend to be kind of gentler and milder and very good for fear and anxiety i would like to say to that person that shouted at you you know you know in a time when it's legal to say well why don't you go and have you know why don't you go and try a nice MDMA session and see how you feel about it after that? Yes, well, no, quite. Although that does raise another really interesting question, because I, which I've also asked a lot, and you probably are. You know, do you think do you think there are people that just won't benefit from psychedelics? People that are either too too resistant, or you know, uh, too repressed, or or just too inflexible. Yeah. I mean, I think there will be some people for whom it is harmful, actually, some like, probably a small number of people. But I, I, I think with any kind of treatment or approach, there will be some people it doesn't work for. So I think it would be completely unique and miraculous if it, if it was different to kind of all other things. Like shamanic approaches are great for many. Some people have a, you know, that they lead to some kind of deterioration. It's the same with, with with everything. So I think there will be some people for whom it's even with kind of careful screening and good therapeutic care, it will still not be the right thing for them. I think probably just a small number of people, then I think there will be more people for whom it's, it's not effective. But I wonder if for many of them, it's not a case of it never being effective, but it's one of those things of starting slowly with a small dose, building the trust and like, you know, rather than going in for a 25 milligram psilocybin experience, thinking, you know, over the next 10 years of your life, you might have three or four gentle slightly increasing journeys with someone you trust yeah thanks and i want to just say um go back to the the defragging the reformatting of the brain that we touched in the beginning so before ros joined the, the group i never heard of a journal called the journal of humanistic psychology i certainly never never heard of it never published in it and as a result of, of ros's work which was not just the therapy she's described today but also talking about the experience with with many of the people who went through and she wrote it up as a, a most remarkable paper in this journal of humanistic psychology and it's certainly the most moving uh, publication of my many hundreds way the most emotionally moving there's ever been and and possibly one of the most important i want you to just tell tell the audience Roz, about you know that those narratives of the recovery are they're just so remarkable aren't they yeah, I'll never, ever, ever forget the that experience. So I was quite new to the team and I did these yeah follow up interviews six months after their session and I went to interview people and it was I think it was the how articulate their accounts were. So for some of them, their depression had come back by that stage. But when they were talking about the psilocybin experience and how they'd been for a few months afterwards, the way they lit up again and how articulate and poetic and vibrant their accounts were was was amazing. And yeah, there was just, I mean, it was in a way it kind of, it was the easiest thing to write ever because you have 20 people whose transcripts from their interviews were just so moving and beautiful, just as standalone things. And then you just kind of, you know, put them together and it, it was lovely. And the, yeah, the, the big theme that came out of it really was around connectedness, that what, that what had happened for them in the experience was that they felt more connected to themselves, other people and, and the world, including the natural world. And that ties so nicely into this idea about, you know, the brain becoming more connected and different parts of the brain more, more connected to. Absolutely. And looking out rather than looking in, of course, you know, yes. disorders like depression and, are, you know, and now we're doing OCD and anorexia studies. Yes. It's all about people getting locked into an internal construct, which is actually destructive and psychedelics that you look at. 
Yeah, the, the the wide lens view, you suddenly zoom out and see yourself as part of this vast interconnected web and feel like a sense of belonging. I think it's that sense of belonging to something that people have often felt so lonely with their distress. And then suddenly they feel the sense of, you know, I'm connected like the mycelial connections beneath the trees and the forest, you know, they're all connected together. Well, that's a very fine note on which to say thank you so much, Roz. It's been wonderful talking to you. It was great working with you. And I do hope at some point you can come back and work with us. That, yes. I, and even if we, you don't come back to work with us, I'm sure you'll be doing important things uh, in the psychedelic space once COVID's out of the way and we can really get back to where we should have been if we hadn't, this little virus hadn't come along. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I will see you soon, I hope. See you soon.